back with you. I want to thank you guys all for coming out on a Monday night. Does that sound as bad to you as it does to me? Am I too high? things Paul ever wrote, really the last thing uh, as far as church history reports for us, was 2 Timothy. And the last chapter of the last thing Paul wrote for us was 2 Timothy 4. And he warned Timothy, he was telling Timothy, preach the word, be a stand in season and out of season. And the reason why, people aren't going to endure sound doctrine. People are going to want their ears tickled. People are going to want you to teach or, and, and tell them and say the things that they want to hear. I said, Timothy, you can't do that. Preach the word. Things haven't changed. People always want to have, as, as Paul said, their ears tickled. They want to be told, you're doing just great. You don't need to change it. All exactly what you believe is right, and, and everything you do is exactly what God wants you to do. Just keep cruising right along. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's keep doing what you're doing. Stay on the, the straight and narrow. Other times it's, no, that's, that's not okay. In fact, right before that, when Paul had told Timothy, we've got the scriptures, they're inspired by God, so you can reprove rebuke and exhort reprove and rebuke that means sometimes you're gonna to have to correct people say don't do that do this or hey you're, you're a little bit off there let's let's change course a little bit and go this way exhort means kind of give people the kick they need to get going sometimes tell them to, to get to work people are gonna to want to have their ears tickled there's no topic that is more ear tickling in today's world than the one we're about to talk about there is no topic in which it is easier to sugarcoat and dance around without actually really saying anything because you can say these things that the Bible says and not really apply them and think, all right, we did it, we preached the scriptures, but then just leave people doing exactly what they already want to do. Leave people understanding things the way that they are. We, we spoke yesterday afternoon about the role of the man in the house, the, the role of the father and the husband and the importance of good, godly men leading their homes in God's ways. That's a really important thing. But we also talked about how easy it is to, to look down on men, to make fun of men, that the, the man is the bumbling idiot of the family, as TV and commercials have told us, and all of those things. And, and that's why tonight's lesson is the one that, that people want their ears tickled, because it's when we push back and say, no, men are important, that we've also got to say, hey, we've kind of misunderstood the woman part of things, too. The, the whole thing where, hey, she's smarter, and, and the whole house has to run through her, and all the jokes we tell about, yes, dear, and happy wife, happy life, there's a part that the husband has to play, and we spoke about that yesterday. But this is really hard for the wife. This is really hard in a feminist world for the wife to say, boy, I'm really not allowed to, to look down on my husband the way that the world has taught me to. I'm really not allowed to, to be, I am woman, hear me roar, the way I, I've been told to do. And so we talk about these things, and man, we can look at the world and see how ridiculous they are. I mean, we live in this time of, of transgenderism and the drag queen thing, and you look at it, and I, I can't even look at it for long. When they put those headlines on the news, I've got I've to avert my eyes because it's so off-putting. You can see that and go, this is so wrong. We know that a man's a man and a woman's a woman, that God create, creates us that way, and that raging against the nature that you were created with, number one, doesn't make anybody happy, but two, it just doesn't work. You can say all day long, I am, I'm what I want to be. You're not. Everybody can tell that you're not. But what we're talking about here, we're talking about this, this feminism. We're talking about the, this identity that has been handed to women in our culture. It's really little different. It's raging against the nature that was given to men and women and saying, I don't have to be what God made me. I can be whatever I want to be. I can be whatever brand of woman I think is best. No, that's not right either. We know what's wrong with the trans issue. We know what's wrong with certain other things. We've got to get what's right, or else we're just going to drift all over the place. We're going to miss what God wants for the husband, for the wife, for the family, for the home, for all the things that, that we've got here. And so we spoke yesterday about the importance of male leadership and, and how male leadership in the home leads to a better church and a better society and all, all of the things that, that fall for, follow through from that. We didn't ask why. Why were men given headship of the home? Why did God say appoint male elders in the churches? And why are men allowed to preach what it says in 1 Corinthians 14? 
women are to keep silent in the church. In 1 Timothy 2, I don't allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Why? Why all of these stipulations? Why all of these, these commandments for the home? Why these male and female roles separate? Some people say, well, it's just because the man was, was around first. Okay, but, but why that? Why was the man first? What, what happened there in the garden with Adam and Eve that God said, you do this, you do that? Why? Or others will say, well, it was a, a part of the curse, the fall. You know, they were supposed to be just equal right there, but because Eve ate the fruit, now well, then she was, she was pushed backwards into the, the secondary role, and, and now she's lesser. And, but in Jesus, when the curse of sin is reversed, that's over. Adam and Eve, we're back on equal footing in every single way, and the roles need to be just erased, and it's men and women are exactly the same. In fact, there's a, a, a professor at Lipscomb I'm Facebook friends with, and we don't really see eye to eye on a lot of things. Nice guy, but we don't really see eye to eye. One of the things he said uh, at one point was, when a Christian man and a Christian woman are both fully mature in Christ, there's going to be no difference between the two of them. Yeah, there is. He can probably throw a football farther. She can probably, uh, you know, have a baby better than he can. There's a difference between them. Our spirituality doesn't get rid of our, our physical nature. That's just Gnosticism. That's, that's a false doctrine. You're still a man and you're still a woman even after you're baptized, even after you're mature in Christ, even after you grow as a Christian. So we have these questions, why? And some people, the world will look at it and just say, that God is sexist. The Bible is sexist. God just, you know, hates women or, or Christians hate women. The people that wrote the Bible, they just hate women and it was a sexist culture, first century, they were backwards, and we've evolved past that. In our culture, we've just kind of outgrown all of those backward ways of thinking. There's a lot of ways we think that we're just way smarter than everybody that ever came before us. How's that working out for us? Again, you've got men saying they're women, women saying they're men, and, and we're pretending that that's okay. We're coming up with surgeries and hormone treatments to make this happen, and, and I mean, there's all of these awful results that are coming out of it, and we go, oh man, we're so much smarter than they used to be. Boy, those, those dumb people back in, in cultures before us, maybe they knew something we didn't. Maybe the fact that our culture is racked with, with terrible mental health, maybe it's because we are raging against the nature that God put in us. We're forgetting what we were created for. There's this, this word that is used sometimes, you'll hear it from time to time, that's a biblical word, is just your, your telos, your designed end. What were you designed for? A chainsaw was designed to chop trees down. Uh, a Phillips head screwdriver was designed to turn screws that have a star pattern in them. That's what they're designed for. If you take that Phillips head, you can use it as a hammer and hit some nails in. It doesn't work very well. It's probably more liable to break that way. You can use it like that, but it, it's really not its designed end. Well, we can be men, like we talked about yesterday, that, that don't do our job. It's not our designed end, and if we don't meet our designed end, we're not going to be happy. You can be a woman and say, well, I want to be this way. Well, if it's not your designed end, you're not going to be happy. But this is how Satan works on us, is to say, no, no, be whatever you want to be. You're not bound to any, any role that God has given you. Be whatever you want to be. And so we ask, why male headship? What is the purpose of, of woman? Why did God create Eve? What's the purpose of human life? What's the purpose of marriage? What's the purpose of all of these things? We spoke yesterday about the culture says it's whatever makes you happy. And that's that atomization, that word we use that if you weren't here, it's this idea that everything has to be broken down to its own individual unit. And that's just a family is a bunch of individuals that are there because they want to be there. And if they don't anymore... I'm out the door. I don't want anything to do with this. I'll cut my parents off. I'll cut my spouse off. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cut my children off. I'm just going to, I don't have any duty or obligation to anybody. I'm here for me. That's what Satan is putting into our heads. And so the way he does that in a marriage and in a household, he starts by targeting women. He starts by putting men and women against each other because if the husband and wife are against each other, the whole family is going to fall apart. And as we spoke yesterday, those wildlife shows, that's how Satan works. Separate everybody from the herd. You're a lot easier to pick off, aren't you? It's a lot easier to grab that zebra that straggled away from the rest and thinks, I'm a strong, independent zebra. I don't need no herd. It doesn't usually work out too well for that zebra. And so we've got this, this dynamic that God created us for, and Satan targets that. And we're going to talk about some of the sins, some of the temptations he throws at people. Let's go to Genesis 3. We read this one yesterday, but it's so key to understanding the male-female dynamic. Genesis chapter 3. The first temptation that Satan is going to throw at women is what we see here, is the temptation of usurpation. 
I pointed out yesterday that Adam's sin, Adam's uh, blame that God put on him was because you listened to your wife. Not because you ate the fruit, but because you listened to her. Adam was put there first. Adam was the one given the commandment. Adam was the one that had this priestly role to teach his family how to follow God, and he didn't do it. That's why he was blamed. Eve is the one that stepped up and made the negotiation with the serpent and said, all right, that sounds good. I'll take a bite. Notice in Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth your uh, children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. We looked yesterday at how that desire is the same desire that sin had for Cain in the next chapter. It's this desire to devour, to overcome, to, to rule. You're going to desire the husband's role as leader of the family. That's what uh, 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 Satan is going to target in women, is that role as the head of the family. And so we see this in male-female competition. We see this in, in, it starts, I mean, even in kindergarten today, boys against girls. And the little boys and, and girls, and, and you're starting to see the statistics flesh out of the higher achievement, decade by decade, is going more and more to girls, and boys are just kind of lost because they're told, take a back seat, it's the girls' time. It's, it's the girls' world now, and, and it's, it's all, all of the, you know, they're going to get the better roles, they're going to get, and, and it manifests in college uh, enrollment, and it manifests in all kinds of different things where boys are sitting at home doing nothing. We've got the weak men we talked about yesterday because they're sitting around going, well, I guess I don't have a job anymore. And the girls are saying, this is mine. I'm going to run everything. I'm going to run the household. I'll wear the pants. I'll take these things over. When I was a kid, there was a, a Gatorade commercial starring Michael Jordan, the great basketball player, and Mia Hamm, you might remember the, the women's soccer player. And it had that old song, and, and it was them playing, squaring off in, in athletic competition. It was that old song, anything you can do, I can do better. And Michael Jordan would beat her at basketball, and she'd beat him at soccer. And he'd beat her at baseball, and she'd beat him at tennis or golf or whatever. You know, they kept going back and forth. And anything you can do, I can do better. Come on. It's Michael Jordan. I mean, yeah, she, she might be a better soccer player than him, but come on. But this is this role, that, that this competition, this, this idea that, uh, in fact, this uh, quote from Gloria Steinem, kind of the feminist icon here in America, she said, women can do what men can. But we don't know that men can do what women can. Essentially, we don't need you. Of course, the famous, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Basically, to say, we don't need you at all. We've got it all taken care of. We really don't need men. We just spoke yesterday about why we really do need men, but why on earth are we saying we don't need each other? If we're going to continue to exist as a species on a biological level, we really need each other. But if we're supposed to thrive as married couples, if we're supposed to thrive as a church, as communities, as, as homes, you need a husband and you need a wife. You need a mom and you need a dad. You need them living in harmony in conjunction with each other and, and complementing each other and bringing to the table what God gave them. Satan says, yeah, I don't really want that. I don't want the family to thrive. I don't want the home to thrive. And so what I need to do is, in, is create competition and create this, this, uh, this arm wrestling happening in the house. Even our current president said a few months ago, there's not a single thing a man can do that a woman can't do as well or better. Not a single thing. I mean, again, blatantly false, but if that were true, there's not a single thing. I mean, literally, let's take that as literally as possible. There's not a single thing that a man can do that a woman can't do as well or better. You, again, you don't need men. We can get rid of all of them. We can tell all of them your services are no longer needed. It's going to be a woman's world now. We need both. We have to have both. We can't, uh, men can't say, I don't need women. Women can't say, I don't need men. But we're at this place where the president of the United States is saying, eh, we only really need one of the two genders. It's ridiculous. But this is the, the path that Satan has set us on. And it's this path that we spoke yesterday about divorce and abortion and all those things. But there's a stat I heard today that 45% of women ages 25 to 44 will be single and childless by 2030. A lot of these stats you hear and says, oh, by 2050, by 2100, by way down the line, generations down the line. No, this is seven years from now, almost half of every woman, 25 to 44, will be single and childless. Now, it's not a sin to be single and childless, but it does say something about a society when we don't have spouses for our, our single people coming up. And we're not, uh, we looked at the birth replacement rate yesterday, we're not having children, we're not replacing ourselves, we're not raising up a society after us. This is a society that is dying. That's what happens with statistics like that. And you see uh, the, the, the loneliness that sets in and the, the unhappiness that sets in. Again, 
it is no coincidence that these stats perfectly correlate with poor mental health, with all kinds of uh, issues on that end in this country. Things are not going well. Satan is winning this battle because we were made for collaboration. You see this in Genesis 3.16 that, that Eve, your desire is going to be for your husband. He will rule over you. Just a chapter before is where we had that beautiful picture of Adam saying, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, in 2.23. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's how it's supposed to be, is this perfect union of two people that, that can't move on without each other, can't thrive, can't live without each other. Adam was given a mission to take dominion over the world and, and to, to be fruitful and multiply and fill it, and all the animals are brought before him, and has realized Adam, he's alone. He can't carry out that mission with the help of any of the animals. It says it's not good for man to be alone. He needed that help meet, that helper suitable for him. And so there's this mission, take dominion, kind of tame the earth as the, as the gardener, as the shepherd, as the keeper of the entire world. Adam, that's your job, and be fruitful and multiply. Fill this with a society, with a civilization, with people. He couldn't do that alone. And so he's given this help meet. He goes out and, and he's supposed to build and, and grow and do all these wonderful things, things that we never got to see happen because they fell in temptation. But then it, it was this idea of he was to take the world, Eve was to fill it. He was, in the same way we have today, a man builds the house, the woman makes it a home. That was God's design. And yet when Satan gets a hold and he, he comes right between the husband and the wife, what happens? We never got to see that happen with Adam and Eve. We never got to see them fulfill that purpose that God put them here for. That's the beauty of Christ in the church, is it is this, this parallel saying, Adam and Eve got it wrong, we're going to get it right. We've got the perfect husband, the perfect uh, husband who's sanctifying the bride, who's not letting her be led astray by Satan, that, that he's making her what she should be, and they're populating the earth in their own way through the Great Commission and evangelism and, and all these things. It's this beautiful picture of it, but in the individual home, we are supposed to exemplify that picture too. I, as a husband, am supposed to be a husband as Christ is to the church, Ephesians 5 says. The wife is supposed to be to her husband as, as the church is to Christ in that submission. But we let the world tell us, no, no, that's no good. You're, you're equal, on equal footing in every way, that you're supposed to submit to each other, that it's not this, this hierarchy. Satan doesn't want the house built, and so he comes in and, again, tries to stand between the husband and the wife. Leads to misery. Leads to broken homes. Leads to a failed society. And so we go back to that question. Why doesn't a woman get to lead? Why did God say not to? Why did God say Adam and then Eve? Why did he say... Wives, submit to your husbands in Ephesians 5 and in 1 Peter 3 and all those passages we have. Why? Again, there's all those answers. Oh, well, the Bible is sexist. Oh, God doesn't like women. Oh, all, all these things. No, it's design. As I said earlier, you have a design that you were created for. You have specific characteristics that make you good at those things. I mentioned earlier, I mean, you can just look at a man and a woman. You can stand a man and a woman next to each other and go, you know what? They weren't made for the same purpose, were they? I am not very good at childbearing. I'm not very good at, at a lot of those kinds of things. God didn't create me for those things. God created a woman for those things. So what did God create a man for? And you, you get into those questions. The, again, the feminists say, we can do anything you can, but you can't do anything we can. No, when it's time for somebody, you know, when, when, uh, especially in old times, when somebody invades the city, you don't send the women out to take care of that. Men are bigger. Men are stronger. Men have more aggression. That was very useful in times like that. And even today, if, if you go home tonight, and man, you hear a door you know, crack open in the middle of the night, you hear a window break, I, I really hope there's no husband in this room that, oh, just, honey, you're taking care of that, right? We traditionally, we know like in our bones that would be very wrong. Why would that be very wrong? If the man is physically capable, that's his job. Why? He's stronger. He has that aggression. He has those characteristics, those principles, those those physical uh, things that God gave him to be that way. And we look at those and we say, well, those are valuable. Strength is valuable. Money-making potential is valuable. Um, uh, all of those things, those are valuable. So we need men and women who can both do that. No, the things that women uniquely bring to the table, those are really valuable too. But we live in a society that worships two things, power and money. And so if uh, you know, we look at it and say, well, men get all the power and money, so we need women to get all the power and money. Well, it's a problem that men live for power and money. But there is a place for, for power and earning and providing and all those things. But it's also a problem where women live for it and it creates this competition. But women are created for nurturing and caring and, and not fighting. Those are beautiful things. 
Children need to be nurtured and cared for. I love my kids. My wife is a lot better at nurturing them in certain ways that, you know, I kind of, my son falls down and starts crying, and it's, all right, come on, dude, get up. Let's go. Scrape it off. Yeah, I mean, I'll be there to comfort him for a second. Okay, you're carrying on a little bit. Mom's there to say, hey, buddy, come on, it's okay. Comfort him, you know. We're wired differently for a reason. But the problem is when you put me in that situation, I'm not very helpful. But if you put her in a situation where she's got to defend against an attacker, she's not really suited to that. The same way in Acts 20 when Paul says, hey, to the elders at Ephesus, wolves are going to come in and try and tear the church apart. Why do we have male elders? Because you don't send women to fight wolves. You don't send the women of the church to stand up to a false teacher and say, sit down, you're not allowed to talk anymore. You don't send a, a woman into society and when they're trying to trans eight-year-old children to say, stop it. We're not allowing this anymore. That's a man's job to do those hard things, to take those difficult stands. We talked yesterday, one of the things men need to be is courageous. Why? Because you were wired that way. You were wired for fighting and women weren't. And that's a good thing. That's, you need both sides of that to create things. But how many bad ideas can come about because Satan goes, you know what? The woman has that more emotional, nurturing nature. Let me key in on that. Let me take advantage of that. Let me work into that. I like to use the illustration of participation trophies. Everyone likes to make fun of participation trophies, right? Oh, all you kids, just get your participation trophies. You know how that happened? I can tell you exactly how it happened. I wasn't there, but I know how it happened. One day, there was a championship game, and one team won, and the other team lost. And there was a poor little kid, probably eight years old, crying on the bench. And one of the moms said, man, I feel so bad for him. We should get trophies for them, too. And somebody might have said, well, they lost. You don't get a trophy. In fact, the thing about it is when you lose, it motivates you to try harder and get better so next season you don't lose. That's, that's kind of losing has its advantages. But that nurturing, that, that positive nurturing, the mom said, well, we, we should give them a trophy too. And maybe somebody else said, yeah. And then one of the men maybe said, well, no, you, you lost. You don't get a trophy. And you know what happened? The weak men that we talked about yesterday said, oh, come on, man. The, the women are going to get mad at us if we say we can't give them trophies. Just get out of the way. Don't be mean. Don't be rude. Don't take a stand on this. And you think, okay, that's pretty dumb. That's, that's participation trophies. Yeah, it's a pretty dumb example. Put in some more serious things. How do bad doctrines come into a church? Because it sounds good to somebody, and the guy who stands up against it, everybody goes, man, I might agree with him, but he's kind of being mean. He's kind of, yeah. and did he really have to say it that way? This is stuff we get at Focus Press all the time. Well, I agree with you guys, but I just, I just wish there wasn't so much fighting. So somebody came in and taught something false. We disagreed with them, and your takeaway is we just shouldn't fight over this. No, you've got to take those stands. That's what the masculinity is there for. The femininity is there to say, you know what, let's make sure everyone is, is welcome. Satan uses those instincts we have against each other. We need to keep them properly ordered for things to work out in the church and in, in the home and, and in all these ways. Notice, in, interestingly, in Deuteronomy 22.5, that's the verse that's appealed to often in the law that says women shouldn't wear men's clothing. A lot of times people today will, will point to that and, and trying to refute it and say, that was talking to battle clothing. The women weren't supposed to wear the armor that the men wore to, to battle. Okay, sure, I'll go along with that. That tells us a lot in itself, doesn't it? You don't send your women out to fight your battles. We as a society do that. We as churches do that. We as families do that. And, and problems ensue. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. might all sound, in fact, to the, to the modern trained mind, this sounds incredibly sexist. The Bible is sexist in a sense, and it says there are men and there are women, and there's differences between the two, but it's very interesting what's said in this section here at the end of 1 Timothy 2 to talk about the, the strengths and weaknesses and why we have these differences between the sexes. 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, likewise I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. 
He says they're, they're not getting up to lead, and, and here's why. Not only the creation order, but she was deceived. Everything I just said, she was the target because she was that, that easier target. She wasn't a fighter. She wasn't going to kill the snake and say, we're not doing that. That was Adam's job. He didn't do it. Eve was not created to do it. She didn't have that role. She didn't have that, that wiring to do so. But notice what it says. It's that, that as it says in verse 9, the modestly, discreetly, good works are her proper uh, claim unto godliness. 1 Peter 3 has a, a similar phrase where it says that a quiet and submissive spirit is pleasing in the sight of God. Why does it use terms like that? Because that's not your wiring. Or that's not your, your temptation. Your temptation is to not be those things. In fact, it, when you hear these things and when the feminist mind hears these things, they think that's so sexist, you shouldn't be that way at all. And yet the scriptures say these are the things that please God. Is when a woman says, I've got every desire in the world to run over my husband, to not be a part of this system, God wants me to, I'm going to submit to that. That is a claim to godliness. That is pleasing in the sight of God. And so the question is, if we think that's pleasing in the sight of God, we've been discipled by the Bible. If it's not, what have we been discipled by? If we look at that and say, well, that's, that's backwards, that's sexist, that's old-timey, that's, okay, who's teaching you? Who has discipled you? Number two, we looked at usurping is the, the uh, temptation that Satan places before women. Number two is contentiousness. When there is that, that battle, as we spoke of yesterday, when a man says, you know what, I've got to make these decisions for the family, I've got to do what's right as the head of the home because I'm going to be responsible for it on judgment day, the woman might have that temptation to be contentious. She might have that, that uh, temptation to punish him for it. And we live in a society, again, where a woman holds all the cards. 70% of divorces today are initiated by women. My brother works as a, a marriage and family therapist, he says, uh, of every divorce case he's had, I, almost every one of them, the woman comes in and says, yep, I want a divorce, I'm done, I want out of here. And the husband says, let's work it out, honey, please, let's meet, let's, let's go to the therapist, let's, let's do whatever it takes to keep it together. And she says, no, I don't want to. Why? Because she holds all the cards. If she takes off, she gets the alimony, she gets the custody of the kids, she gets the sympathy of all the friends and, and everything that goes along with it, and the guy just has to move on and, okay, well, what, what choice does he have? Good, godly women say, you know what, I have all the, the power in this relationship because of the society we live in. I'm not going to take that upper hand. I'm not going to use that option. I was with a minister friend the other day. He got a call. Close buddy from a church called and said, yep, yeah, I came home from work today, and my wife said, we're getting a divorce, and she might have another man. Uh, there's just story after story after story of that in this day and age because women are told, you have all the cards. If you want in, you want out, that atomization, do whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good, because you're going to win in every single way if you get this divorce. Godly woman can't do that. But even if you don't get divorced, there's all kinds of terms. As I said yesterday, we joke casually about this, uh, you know, about the, the man kind of saying, yes, dear, and I'm sorry to his wife. But one of the other ones is, oh, the doghouse. Oh, I guess he's sleeping on the couch tonight. You can't say you're a submissive wife who loves her husband and respects her husband, if you pull the trick where you say, all right, honey, you're sleeping on the couch or you're in the doghouse. I'm not talking to you for the next X number of days because you made a decision I don't like. That's a sin. That's not okay. First Corinthians 7 says withholding sex from your partner, and, and it's in both directions, the wife for the husband and the husband for the wife. It says your bodies belong to each other, but if you say, I'm mad at you, and so I'm not sleeping with you for the next however many months, years, how, whatever it may be, you're in sin. And that's something that, again, culture tells women, you have these tools as a bargaining chip in your marriage. The Bible says, no, you don't. You don't get to be that way. But it, it, Satan, again, says, well, if your husband's going to try and lead, be contentious. Make everything an issue. Don't go along with it. Drag your feet kicking and screaming. There's a reason Proverbs comes back around to this term contentiousness over and over. A contentious woman. It says that living with a contentious woman is like having a constant dripping. You ever been in a room where there was a faucet dripping? Just that. And for the first 20 seconds, it's not that bad. And if you're in there for more than five minutes, you start to lose your mind. There's a reason that there's a torture device is the dripping, right? It drives you insane. Solomon said, yeah, that's what it's like to live with a woman that makes everything an issue. A woman that fights over everything. He, he goes on to say that it's, it's better to live in the corner of the roof. Just... Don't, you don't want to go in the house. You don't want to be around her. Just, just stay up there. Mind your own business in your own little space because it's better than dealing with a contentious woman. He says later on, it's, it's better to live in a desert land, living out there, 
dying of thirst, in the heat, whatever it may be, you're better off there than with a woman who's going to make everything a problem. As a Christian woman, you can't have that attitude that says, you know what, he may be the leader of the family, but I'm going to punish him every time he tries to do it. If I disagree with him, I'm going to make him know that I disagree and that he's not going to be happy until he makes me happy, until he goes along with my way. Yeah, this is difficult. Both of the roles are difficult. As we spoke of yesterday, for men to lead and make unpopular decisions and know that, hey, maybe my wife's going to be really mad at me for doing this thing I think is the right thing to do, that's really difficult. For a wife to submit to your husband and say, I think he's making the wrong choice here, but God says i got to submit, that's really difficult. Nobody said it was easy. But when we go back to that idea of design and you do things the way they were designed to work, yeah, it's not always easy. It's best, though. If you make things work in ways they weren't designed to work, everybody ends up miserable. The family ends up splitting up. We've got all the statistics on that. Nobody comes out of that happy. And so, yeah, sometimes being happy, being fulfilled, and, and the joy in the house takes some difficult decisions. It takes a wife saying, I really don't want to do this, but you know what? God said quiet and submissive spirit is what's pleasing in his sight. It takes a husband saying, you know what? Leading my wife and, and considering her and loving her and laying down my life for her, that's going to be what, what this family needs, and I'm going to make these hard decisions and do what's right. Yeah, all of these things are difficult. But again, look at the fruits. Would you say the world is happy right now? Would you say the world with a 50% divorce rate, with an, an unmarried rate, with a 70% cohabitation rate, with the abortion rate, with the, uh, the rates? Of, I've been over the statistics in, in each of these lessons. I don't need to keep rehashing them. Do these look like happy people? Do you turn on the TV and go, man, what a well-adjusted society. Everyone's doing great. No, the fruit is not there. The fruit's not there. And you can look back and say, well, there were times in, in our past when, when you know, men dominated and it, weren't, it wasn't great. Yeah, we got here in large part because men dominated in ways they weren't supposed to or they abdicated the role they, they were supposed to have. As we spoke about yesterday, the two temptations of men are going to be stomping on their wife or being a doormat for their wife. Neither one of those works out really well. And when they do, the wife either rises up to fight back, as Satan wants them to do, or when the husband's a doormat, she walks all over him. Neither one of those work out well. The temptations for men and the temptations for women perfectly align for misery. That's why we've got to be aware of ourselves and what we bring to the relationship and fight against it and say, that's not what God wants me to do. That might be my greatest instinct is to do that. It's not going to work. And so we say, well, you're not supposed to usurp. You're not supposed to be contentious. What are you supposed to do? Interestingly, go to 1 Timothy 5 while we're in this section. 1 Timothy 5. You might have noticed, might not have. Uh, a lot of times I don't even look at these things, but I, I chose the lesson titles specifically. Yesterday's uh, in the afternoon, I believe, was about the head of the house or the head of the home or something like that. The one night is the ruler of the house. Kind of weird. Aren't those the same thing? Biblically, it's, it's an interesting terminology. Of course, the head of the house, the, the head of the home, the head of the wife, the head of the children is the father. So who's the ruler of the house? Why would that be somebody different? We've got to get into the specifics of what that means. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And as we look at Paul writing to Timothy, teaching them, this is about the widows and about the older women. If they're widowed, they're over 60 years old, they meet a few qualifications, the church is supposed to carry them, to, to financially support them. The younger women... Not so. Verse 11, but refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan." My version there in verse 14 says, keep house. Um, interestingly, that word there is oh, house despot. is a combination, it's a, a compound word in the Greek. House despot, house ruler. That's her job, is to be the ruler of the house. What does that mean if the husband's the head of the house? It means he has delegated. He says, I'm running this family. I'm providing for it. I'm making sure this family has what it needs. The wife is the ruler of the house. In the same sense uh, that anybody that's delegated authority and told this is your job, I'm expecting you to do it, he's placed that under her authority. You think about like Joseph in the Old Testament when Potiphar says he put everything in his house under Joseph's authority. Joseph ruled that house. Was Joseph over Potiphar? No. But when Potiphar wasn't there or, or when any decision needed to be made, that was Potiphar's, or that was Joseph's realm was to take care of that. 
What says that, that these younger women are to be the ruler, the keeper of the house? Similarly, in Titus chapter 2, it tells uh, Titus teach the older women to teach the younger women to love their husbands and children to keep the home. That's the center of their work. But notice the things that he says will, will pull them away from these things in verse 13. Idleness, gossips, busybodies. And it's interesting that, that gossip, that busybodiness, it's exactly the kind of thing that, that takes women's good instincts of nurturing and caring about people and turns it negative. Okay, you care about people. Let's, what's, the, what's the scuttlebutt? What's going on with so-and-so? Well, you know, have you heard about this, that, and the other thing? Have you heard about what's happening with, with Mrs. So-and-so? Not good. Where does that come from? From idleness, from time on their hands. Why do you have time on your hands? Because you're not doing your job as the, the keeper of the house, as the manager, the, the ruler of the house. And so, so many times you get into these and, and people start debating, well, can a woman work outside of the home? Can she, can she make money for the family? Can she not? Well, you go to Proverbs 31 and she worked outside the home. And only... Sidestepping that whole debate, what is the point of this? That the woman's primary work in the family is her home. You look at the Proverbs 31 woman, the same thing. She was making sure her husband and, and kids were clothed and fed and the house was kept warm and clean and all the things that she had to do. Here it says, be the, the ruler of the house, keeping the house, bearing the children. Uh, in, in Titus 2, the same thing, being workers at home. That is their primary realm. Why? Because the husband's realm is outside the home. Same with Adam and Eve. He was supposed to go build the world. She was supposed to fill it and care for it. And he was supposed to build the house. She was supposed to make it a home. The same kind of thing is what we have here. But notice as we looked earlier, it said that these things that they do are an appeal to godliness or pleasing in God's sight. In verse 14, when she doesn't get married, bear children, keep house, give the enemy no occasion for reproach. It's when the idleness sets in. It's when the gossip sets in. It's when she's not doing those things. It's when she's getting distracted by other obligations that Satan goes, cool, I can come in right there and wedge in that family. I can split that husband and wife. I can split that wife and children. I can turn her focus a different direction. In this day and age, there's a million different ways that can happen. And again, uh, you know, if it's possible to work outside the home and not have it uh, be, be your primary responsibility, okay, but you see so many times our, our culture has been indoctrinated into this, okay, six in the morning, wake up, get your kids out the door, drop them off with somebody at seven, they go to school, they go on to their daycare, you go get the kids at six, take them to their soccer practice, get them home at seven, uh, throw them McDonald's down their throat, get them a bath, to bed by eight. I wouldn't call that working in, in the home. I wouldn't call that prioritizing the home. I wouldn't call that any of those things, and when those things aren't being met, the home starts to fall apart these issues begin to spring up. And so there's this question of, what does our family need? How can I prioritize the home? And the husband, how can I provide and make sure that this is, is where it needs to be so that she can do her job and I can delegate house rulership to her? Again, difficult, but God gives us the design and how it's supposed to work best. You see all throughout Scripture, women have this supporting role. You see Deborah, that the, the female judge. You've got all these male judges, and she's the female judge, but what does she do? She doesn't go out and fight the battle. What does she do? She goes and gets the men, and she's almost like a mother figure to Barak and, and the other men of Israel to say, guys, get your act together and get out there and fight. And you see Barak, he's, he's kind of that cowardly man we talked about yesterday. He says, well, I'll go if you go with me. Not great, but eventually he goes, and eventually you know, the men rise up. But you see Deborah supporting, pushing men into that spot. You see the women that supported Jesus, so many of them, following him around, financially supporting, serving him, caring for him. Having, they were the ones going to the tomb to care for the body of Jesus, that supporting role that makes all the difference in the world. You look at Ruth, you look at Hannah raising up Samuel, uh, and, and that he became the one that anointed David, and, and all that comes about from that. Mary herself, you know, we're, we're not Catholics, we're not Orthodox, and so we get a little nervous about Mary, but she was really important. No, we don't worship her. No, we don't pray to her. We don't do any of those things, but boy, did she do a really nice job. Man, was she really important. You see the beauty of a woman fulfilling the role that God put her in. She wasn't out there preaching. That was John the Baptist's role to tell people Jesus was coming. Her job was to raise the Savior, and she did. You look at it, uh, I mean, just, again, Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha, and, and you know, Jesus having his, uh, his hair, or her, she takes the, the perfume and washes his feet with her hair. And it says there, wherever the gospel is preached around the world, this story will be told in honor of her. We still read those passages of a woman supporting Jesus, anointing Jesus, showing the love to Jesus. 
She didn't have to get up and preach. She didn't have to get up and fight or, or do any of those things. She didn't have to slay a giant. None of those things was that supporting role. And you notice that in Proverbs 31, that it says that, that her children rise up and call her blessed because they know the value of a really good mom that prioritized the home. And it says that her husband, number one, he trusts in her, but also he says you, you know, you, your, uh, your value exceeds rubies. He knows what he has at home. He knows the beauty and the value of a good wife. That it is this, this relationship that a husband can't, a man can't fully be what he's supposed to be without a wife, and a wife can't be what she's fully supposed to be without a husband, and they can't together be that, that thing that they're supposed to be if they don't hit their roles properly. If they're fighting against each other, if they're trying to be the same thing, if they're trying to play the same role, it's not going to work out. And that, I would say, is the one good thing, to, to go back to where we started as, as we begin to wrap up, the one good thing about transgenderism. There's not a lot of good things about it. And you're going to say, well, there's anything good about it? Yeah. It's making us look and go, okay, why are there males and females? We know that a man can't be a woman, we know a woman can't be a man, but what does it mean to be a man? We forgot about that. What does it mean to be a woman? We, we kind of forgot the answer to that. We raise our sons and daughters exactly the same all the way up until... I don't think we've, we've reached the point where we change anymore. We raise them to think the same way, to value the same things, to aim towards the same things. It doesn't work that way. We get back to asking, all the way back to Adam and Eve, why did God create a man and make him as a man and, and make him a little bit bigger and stronger and with, with those male hormones inside? And then the woman, why did he make her the way she is and, and more slight and feminine and, and with the female hormones and the differences between the two? Why? Well, when you start answering those questions as we have yesterday and today, and you, you start seeing what roles they, the, and the puzzle piece that they make up together, you have a really beautiful picture. The minute you sever that, the minute you, you say, well, these things don't really matter, or those are old school, or whatever, you just start down that path toward all the insanity we see today, where it says you can be whatever you want. Whatever parts you're born with, whatever, you know, anything about you, eh, that's all up for, for debate. Do what you want to do. Be who you want to be. No, be who you were created to be. That's how it works out best. That's our Lord and Savior loves us. Jesus, as, as the, the creator of all things, all things hold together, Colossians 1, because of him, he loves us. He made us the way we are, male and female, with that incredible value. He gave us souls. He died for us. He, he created us, male and female, again, because of his design, because of his love, because of his brilliance and wisdom that we just don't have. We're all happier and better off when we're submitted to him, living in the light of his kingdom. If you're not, as always, the invitation is extended to repent of your sins, to put him on in baptism, to walk that path. But if, especially after yesterday's, yesterday morning and after this evening, we've got husbands in this room, we've got wives in this room, we've got potential husbands in this room, potential wives in this room, ask the question, do I know what it means to be a man? Do I know why God made me a man? Do I know what it means to be a woman? Do I know why God made me a woman, if you're a woman? About your sons and daughters, your grandchildren, Anybody in your life, do we realize that? Because when we get those things right, man, things really start to go well. We've got so much work to do in a society that's falling apart so bad, but it starts in the home. You get the home right, everything else starts to flow from it. And so husbands, wives, be what God created you to be. We're going to talk about children tomorrow night. I want to invite you back to that. But if there's any need, come as we stand and sing.